Chapter 62 Benjamin and his brothers Genesis 44, 1-34 And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in the sack's mouth, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest, and his corn money. And he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their asses. And when they were gone out of the city and not yet far off, Joseph said unto his steward, Up, follow after the men. And when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Is not this it in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth? Ye have done evil in so doing. And he overtook them, and he spake unto them these same words. And they said unto him, Wherefore saith my Lord these words? God forbids that thy servants should do according to this thing. Behold the money which we found in our sacks mouths, we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both him let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. And he said, Now also let it be according unto your words, He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. Then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground, and opened every man his sack. And he searched, and began at the eldest, and left at the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they rent their clothes, and laded every man his ass, and returned to the city. And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there, and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? What ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we, and he also with whom the cup is found. And he said, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant, and as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asks his servant, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we said unto the, my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother come down with you, you shall see my face no more. And it came to pass, when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Go again, and buy us a little food. And we said, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother be with us, then we will go down, for we may not see the man's face, except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant my father said unto us, Ye know that my wife bare me two sons, and the one went out from me. And I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I saw him not since. And if ye take this also from me, and mischief befall him, ye shall bring down my grey hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to thy servant my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass, when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die, and thy servants shall bring down the grey hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. For thy servants became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father for ever. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father? Genesis 44, 1-34 As we have seen, 
the Joseph narrative is a very powerful statement of God's total predestination of all things. The only two logical views of time, history and creation, are predestination and chance. God is the presupposition of predestination, and chance is the negation of all meaning and reason. Most men who deny predestination all the same, quote-unquote, borrow some of its implications of order and meaning. Implicit in such a denial is the rejection of God. All too many refuse to follow the logic of the rejection of predestination. They want God without thunder, or the idea, some of the power of God's, but not all of God. It is revelatory that biblical scholars will write on Joseph without admitting that predestination is basic to the entire account. The total interlock of events and circumstances is so total that such an omission is startling, although commonplace. Events move unerringly to their predestined conclusion. There is an important aspect to this predestination that must not be overlooked. In verse 16, Judah comments on this, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak, or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Now the goblets had been deliberately planted on Joseph's orders in Benjamin's sack. Judah and his brothers did not know this. They saw it as a mysterious work of God to avenge Joseph's enslavement. The guilty conscience of the ten brothers led them to see and an erring predestination by God to punish them for their guilt. In this they were, to a degree, right? Apart from atonement and forgiveness thereby, men are inescapably guilt-ridden, and their reactions are masochistic, self-atonement by self-punishment, or sadistic, self-atonement by punishing others. In either case, God's predestination or Man's guilt-ridden view of events as moving against him, there is no brute or meaningless factuality. Everything carries a full load of meaning. It is of interest that a moral order of authority has appeared among the brothers. Reuben's act of incest had led to the loss of his headship. Levi and Simeon had forfeited their place by shaming their father and making Jacob's word of no account by their massacre of the Shechemites. None questioned Judah's right to be the firstborn in authority, although born forth. The cup sewn into Benjamin's sack was a part of Joseph's office, to be a diviner. This meant pouring water into the bowl, staring into it until some kind of vision appeared, and then forecasting in terms of it. Joseph himself had no need for such a device, but it was a part of his priestly paraphernalia. The brothers were sure of their innocence this time and ready to surrender for execution the one who had the bowl. Verse 9. They could not imagine that Benjamin could be held guilty since Benjamin had the least to do with the loading of the sacks of grain. But Benjamin had been favoured by the Prime Minister, which could mean greater opportunity to steal, a fact that did not occur to the brothers. They were sure of his innocence. The ten knew themselves to be guilty men, they were not unwilling to recognize that, in some mysterious way, God would avenge Joseph on one of them, but never on Benjamin. When the bull was found in Benjamin's sack, the horror-stricken brothers rent their clothes in grief and all returned with Benjamin to the city. Judah then told the Prime Minister their family history, all save their guilt with respect to the supposedly dead brother. They could not return to Canaan without Benjamin, the shock of his loss would kill Jacob, their father. Judah was ready to replace Benjamin as the bondman to the prime minister. Verse 33. He could not face his father without Benjamin. Verse 34. The ten brothers had met the test. They did not desert Benjamin. All had returned with him, although all save Benjamin were free to go their way. They now had very tender consciences and an obvious love of their father, Whatever shortcoming they might otherwise have, their regard for their father was very great. Their ten brothers now obviously recognized something they had earlier resented, namely that for Jacob, 
Rachel was his first love and his real wife, and therefore Joseph and Benjamin were his sons in a particular way. However much the relationship between Rachel and Leah had healed by the time they left Laban, it had not healed or Leah's sons and the sons of Bilhan and Zilpah were concerned until they lived with their father's grief. The fact that Jacob loved Joseph and Benjamin more did not mean that he did not love his other sons. In verse 10, we are told that only the one whose sack contained the divining bowl would be held as a slave or bondman to the prime minister. The rest would be free to go. This meant when the bowl was found in Benjamin's sack that Benjamin, like Joseph, would become a slave in Egypt. A grim and ironic fact that the other brothers could not miss. It was somehow God working to avenge Joseph. All ten went to the prime minister's house and prostrated themselves on the ground in supplication. Verse 14. Joseph told the ten they were free to go, but Judah spoke for all in saying that they could not so mistreat their father. Their conduct was now very different from their earlier treatment of Joseph. Joseph. 